the rectus joint, this is the, the medial view of the frontal lobe. Uh, we can see um, the corpus callosum medially, which it's not part of the frontal lobe, but it's really uh, nicely seen. What is embracing superiorly the, front, the corpus callosum is, the limb, is, is a limbic uh, component. It's the cingulate gyrus. And the cingulate gyrus, inferiorly to the rostrum, it connects to the rectus gyrus, making the pole here that some people call the singlet pole. Yashua you would call the singlet pole. And then more anteriorly, the rectus gyrus. The rectus gyrus is divided from the singlet gyrus from the superior hostal sulcus and harbors the inferior hostal sulcus. The rectus gyrus continues itself uh, superior and posteriorly into the frontal, uh, superior frontal gyrus. And between the superior frontal gyrus and singlet gyrus, we have the cingulate sulcus. The cingulate sulcus posteriorly ascends, marking uh, being the ascending branch of the cingulate gyro, of uh, the cingulate sulcus, and marking the posterior aspect of the paracentral lobule. The paracentral lobule is in fact the pre and post central gyrus. Anterior is the pre and this, the pre central gyrus related to the uh, movement of the leg, and posteriorly the sensory motor area of the leg as well. The surface anatomy has been reviewed by several uh, authors, and you can see these all spread on the literature. And this anatomy is important for the neurosurgeon since uh, the development of uh, microneurosurgery, especially uh, with Professor Yasha Gill, using the SUSI as the main corridors to approach uh, deep lesions and deep uh, compartments of the brain. And we'll talk about using these so this frontal suicide and these uh, cisterns to approach uh, uh, frontal lesions. Now, what is inside the frontal lobe? Let's do a white matter fiber dissection. When we first decorticate the brain, we remove the gray matter, we'll see the first subcortical layer. The first subcortical layer is made by U fibers. These U fibers are short association fibers connecting uh, gyri that are uh, uh, next to themselves. More inferiorly, we see uh, a very uh, big um, fascicle, it's called the superior longitudinal fascicle. The superior longitudinal fascicle is in fact divided into several uh, fasciculi. The most medial one is a direct connection between the frontal and posterior temporal uh, lobe. It's called the arcade fascicle. This is the one that uh, people usually remember, but the most superficial ones are, are shorter and we have a more horizontal one connecting frontal to parietal lobes. And we have a vertical one connecting parietal to temporal lobes. These are also called the indirect uh, components of the superior longitudinal fascicle. Everything here is called superior longitudinal fascicle. And so people will even go further to be dividing the superior longitudinal fascicle, the, the, the horizontal components into three parts, each one related uh, to a different uh, frontal and parietal regions. And uh, uh, um, as you can see, uh, broadly, SLF1 is deep inside the superior frontal uh, gyrus, SLF2 deep inside the middle frontal gyrus, and SLF3 deep inside the inferior frontal gyrus. And they will connect, you can see here, to parietal uh, uh, components. And we can see nice dissections of the literature from Dr. Khan, Yagrimoglu of these tracts. And the most deep ones are in fact the uh, uh, arc uh, arcade fascicle. And the arcade fascicle can also be traced using tratography. So these are nice uh, uh, images that we see on the literature correlating fiber dissection with tratography and how they come really close together. And this is an image from Professor Hugh Dufault trying to understand the, uh, uh, the the, the functional role of each part. So the SLF is mainly seen as uh, on the dominant hemisphere as an articulatory and phonological uh, stream of language. On the, and on the right side, it would be more about visual cognition. So we have these two functional roles of the SLF. What about the frontal Aslan, uh, Aslan tract? The frontal Aslan tract is, an, is a, a tract usually seen on DTI and hardly seen on dissection, but it is connecting the inferior frontal gyrus to the superior frontal gyrus or SMA region. It's also an association of fibers. 
and the literature has been related to working memory deficiencies or construction paralysis or visual spatial, where for us that are neurosurgeons, it has not been related to functional, uh, to functional deficits when we work deep inside these tracts. Now, even more deep inside the frontal lobes, we'll see we'll have other tracts, but these all other tracts are really intermingled together. And to understand them, it's usually uh, e uh, easily beginning in, at the insular lobe, because at the, at the central lobe, deep inside the insula, since we have the basal ganglia, the basal ganglia is dividing these tracts into capsules. And if we follow this capsule superiorly, they will go inside the frontal lobe. But at the central core, what is nice that nature already uh, uh, separated them by this uh, basal ganglia. But at the frontal lobe, they are really together. So let's scratch the insula here. We first decorticate. We see the extreme capsule. The extreme capsule of the insula is the first subcortical layer of the insula. It's made also by short association fibers. And these short association fibers are coming from the insula to the inferior frontal gyrus as well. So we can see here then they are going to the superior opercula as well. If you go more deeply inside the insula, we'll have the claustrum. And then uh, at, this, uh, uh, at this depth of dissection, we can see three sets of fibers, three fiber tracts. The more anterior one is the uncinate fascicle. Then the intermediary one is the inferior frontal occipital fascicle. And the most posterior one is arriving from the claustrum. It's called claustrofugal or claustrocortical fibers. Um, this is an, uh, a nice, a nice uh, drawing of David Pease uh, showing these three tracks that is deaf and how they will go into the frontal lobe. The uncinate fascicle will go from the temporal lobe to the frontal orbital region. The, uncinate, the uh, inferior frontal occipital fascicle will spread towards the frontal lobe and will connect uh, these regions to the posterior temporal and occipital lobe. And uh, both together form a semantic, a semantic stream of language. Uh, it has been related to the semantic uh, uh, aspects of language by several authors uh, doing awake uh, craniotomies. And this is a picture from Dr. Dufour also using these uh, connections to explain this, uh, uh, this, this uh, semantic stream of language. More posteriorly, we saw the claustrum. The claustrum spreads itself, it spreads its connection towards all uh, uh, cerebral hemisphere. And it's hard to understand what it's made for, but uh, uh, unilateral damage of claustrum will not, will not uh, lead to um, functional deficit. So what is important for us neurosurgeons is that the claustrum uh, uh, can be uh, uh, approached or, or damaged without a functional, a functional uh, uh, problem if you do it uh, unilaterally. What about the internal capsule? The internal capsule will be made about uh, by a lot of projection fibers inside the central core. It's really well seen, but then inside the frontal lobe, they are really merged. Uh, the most posterior and eloquent part of the, of the uh, uh, internal capsule is made by uh, the pyramidal tract that's coming uh, from the pre-central gyrus. This is the most eloquent part of the internal capsule. It's related to the genu and to the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Um, these are projection fibers. We have all uh, other projection fibers. I'm just going to distinguish two. We have uh, the fiber that's coming from the cortex to so the basal ganglia, then thalamus, then cortex again. This makes a series of loops uh, inside the frontal lobe. It's, you can see these on the literature, each one related to a different uh, aspect of cognition. We have a motor loop, an oculomotor loop, and a prefrontal loop, but it's really not related to functional deficits when we work unilaterally. We can do this um, without being afraid of harming this, harming, uh, harming them. And another set of projection fibers is the cortical pultine cerebellar fibers. They will arise from all the cerebral cortex, but the frontal ones are distinguished as the frontal pontine cerebral uh, fibers. Of course, they will arise from the frontal lobe, uh, going down into the internal capsule, and then more inferiorly into the pons, 
where, where these fibers will cross to the other side and get inside the cerebellum through the middle cerebellar peduncle. These are rising from all cerebral lobe. And more at the midline, we have the corpus callosum and the corpus callosum and midline is a very compact structure with a lot of fibers, but laterally it will spread its fibers into all cerebral hemisphere and the most anterior fibers are related to the frontal uh, lobe. What is about uh, the neurosurgical application of this is that the, the surface anatomy of the frontal lobe is hardly seen into surgery because we have these uh, vessels and, and, uh, and, uh, and the piamater and arachnoid over the surface, what is make us uh, hardly see the suicide. So we use anatomy and technology to guide us. Uh, a lot of people will have ultrasound, intraoperative uh, imaging, but some people uh, of the world will not. Uh, here in Brazil, unfortunately, we don't have neural navigation on all our or ours. So we developed, we as our group, uh, led by Dr. Guilherme Ribas, developed this set of uh, cranial cerebral key points that will um, uh, aid us to understand where the main suicide are. So you can see this on the literature. There is a set of, uh, of landmarks that will correlate cranial surface to the cerebral surface. And each point will also be related to the deep aspect of these points as well. Uh, to the frontal uh, lobe, we distinguished more uh, two points here. This is the Stefanium and the anterior squamous point and the superior squamous point. So we can see the, the squamous suture here, what's more anteriorly and what's more superiorly. They will be related uh, respectively to the anterior even point and to the inferior hollandic point. So if you just take the superior aspect of the squamous suture, we can see that uh, directly underneath this point, we'll have the inferior aspect of the central sulcus. That's the inferior hollandic point. So this is the posterior margin of the, of the, of the frontal lobe. And if we see superiorly, what is the superior aspect of the central sulcus? The superior aspect of the central sulcus will be called the superior hollandic point, and it will be five centimeter posterior to the bragma. So if we just use these two points, we can understand where the central sulcus is. And of course, the frontal lobe will be directly superior. Another interesting point is this point here, there's three centimeters off midline and one and a half centimeter posterior to the coronal suture. This is the point that marks the uh, connection of the superior frontal sulcus with the precentral sulcus. And this is an important part because we can use the superior frontal sulcus as a route to reach the lateral ventricle as I'm gonna show. If you have a superficial lesion, it's more easily, you can uh, approach this superficial lesion directly, but of course, remember uh, the, the white matter of fascicles that are related to it. So if you have a lesion centered in the superior frontal gyrus, uh, understand that if it is spreads posteriorly, it will get inside the supplementary motor area. And if, you, if it goes even more posteriorly, it will get into the uh, M1, the primary motor area. This is, uh, of course, important if you are doing awake neurosurgery and you want to stimulate, um, you need to understand what function uh, you are dealing with so you can know what to expect that the patient will be uh, transient, uh, they will have a transient deficit. Of course, if you stimulate posteriorly, he can have a moderate deficit. If you stimulate more inferiorly, for example, the pre of the, the ventral premotor area, the patient is likely to have a speech arrest. So it's important for uh, uh, to understand which fascicles are you being connected to. And the more inferior you go, the more into language areas you are getting into. Of course, the inferior frontal uh, gyrus will harbor the, uh, the speech area, the expression uh, area of language. And as, as most posterior you go, the more you get inside this area. Central lesions are always challenging. You have to know that anterior to them, you have the uh, pyramidal tract and posterior to them, you have some of the sensory areas and you have to uh, uh, um, um, do, do some uh, brain mapping not to harm these very eloquent uh, fibers. 
then deep inside the, the frontal lobe, we have the ventricle and how to reach the ventricle. We have many ways. We have the interhemispheric way of doing this. This is the transcalosal approach. We have, of course, the transsuicide approaches or the transfrontal approaches to the uh, uh, lateral ventricle. So this is the interhemispheric approach. It's more suitable for very midline lesions. So if you have an anterior horn and uh, uh, body of the ventricle, these are midline uh, uh, compartments. Uh, the first step is to go really close to midline, not harming the sinus. You have to work uh, between these veins, okay? And it's likely to have a big space anterior to the coronal suture. But you have to work between these veins and then get inside this cleft between the fox on the midline and the middle surface of the brain. Uh, laterally, the, the superior colossal uh, uh, cistern will have uh, a cistern directly superior to the corpus callosum. Then underneath these main arteries, the callosal marginal inside the, uh, uh, the, the cingulate uh, sulcus and the pericolosal artery directly over uh, the corpus callosum. And we will spread those arteries and look for the corpus callosum to do the callosotomy. Where we are gonna do the callosotomy, of course, depends when where your, where your lesion is. Um, if, if you want to get inside the third ventricle later, you need to understand where the, the, the foramen row will project on the corpus callosum. This is usually two and a half centimeter posteriorly. So uh, some people will do this uh, uh, callosotomy two and a centimeters posteriorly. <laughs> um, another interesting point here is to see the bragma and know that five centimeter posterior to the bragma will have the approach of the of the central sulcus into the into the interhemispheric fissure. Why it is important because you don't want to put your spatula over the pre the paracentral lobule. If you put your spatula over the para, the paracentral lobule, the patient is likely to have um, uh, inferior limb uh, motor impairment. So you put your spatula. Uh, more anterior to this. Here we are going to do the callosotomy, the callosotomy two and a half centimeter posterior to the genu. If we want to see the foramen row on the middle of our callosotomy, uh, this is more anatomy, an anatomy view. No one will do a callosotomy this big, but it's just to pinpoint that inside the ventricle, you will look for some veins to guide us, the anterior septal vein directly uh, over the the, the, the septum and the uh, thalamus right vein between the thalamus and the caudate nucleus laterally. Uh, if you want to go inside, inside the third ventricle later, you will open the choroidal fissure and get inside the third ventricle to the roof of the third ventricle. If you want to go transfrontal, uh, I am more likely to use the suicide, some people will use the gyri, but the suicide are always pointing to the nearest ventricular cavity. So it's very nice to use the suicide to get inside the, the, the frontal horn. It's more suitable for lateral lesions because you're coming a little bit off midline. And so if you have a lesion on the caudate nucleus, uh, perhaps uh, using the superior frontal circles will be a nice, a nice approach. And we have this point that I said is two centimeters or one and a half centimeters posterior to the coronal suture and three centimeter off midline, you will see this, uh, this point that marks the, the, the posterior point of the superior frontal circle. So if you just understand this point, you can dissect the superior frontal circles from this point anteriorly and use this as a route to get inside the lateral ventricle. This is a very unusual approach to, to the lateral ventricle. This is a transinsular approach. Uh, if you are exposing the insula, you are spreading the opercula, you can use a very anterior approach to the anterior horn. I've never seen someone doing it, but it has been uh, 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 referenced in, in, on, on the literature. You will make uh, um, a cut deep uh, anterior 
to the to the insula. This cut will be at the anterior limiting circles, and we will approach the anterior part of the lateral ventricle. Okay, this is just uh, uh, images where we will make this cut to get inside the anterior horn. Uh, approach to the lateral ventricle is an extension of the approach of the lateral ventricle. Just to understand that you can go really transforaminal approach, or you can really open the choroidal fissure, what is called the transchoroidal approach. You can you do the transchoroidal approach between the fornix and the plexus, uh, the choroid plexus, or you can use you can do this between the choroid plexus and the thalamus. You can choose. Uh, most people will do it between the fornix and the choroid plexus, because then you can go uh, between both uh, internal cerebral veins and get inside the third ventricle. So these are just anatomy pictures. Here, I am displacing here the fornix here and the choroid plexus here, and we'll make a cut between both these structures and displace even more immediately the, 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 the fornix to expose uh, the both uh, internal cerebral veins at the roof of the third ventricle, and then we can displace them and get inside the third ventricle. This is the transchoroidal approach. And in some cases, we can cut the mass intermedia uh, and expose all the, uh, the roof of the third ventricle, okay? This is the subchoroidal approach. Some people will look for this uh, route here between the choroid plexus and the thalamus. Uh, what is the disadvantage of this approach? Uh, you are coming from more laterally, and usually you will have the thalamus right vein anteriorly, what will block your view to the most anterior part of the third ventricle. So if you want to get into the anterior part of the third ventricle, it will be hard because this approach is uh, will have the thalamus right vein on your on your surgical uh, route. And I've never seen this also, but it has been. Uh, reference by Michael Apuzo, the interphone CO approach. So you can go into both laminas of the of the of the septum pellucidum deep inside. You see both furnaces, and between them you will reach the roof of the third ventricle as well. Okay, this is a very clear approach, but uh, unfortunately I've never seen uh, someone doing it. Okay, once again, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a, it's an honor to participate. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Vibas, uh, for this excellent uh, illustrative presentation. Thanks to you, uh, Father Professor Bellarmo, uh, and his um, revolutionary paper. We are uh, now uh, all to you and uh, him. Um, in every in every surgery that we all do because of the surgical points. Um, there is uh, one question in chat box asking about disconnection syndrome when you're using anterior interspheric transcalosal approach. Let me see. Is the is the Q and A how to avoid connection? Uh, is the fornix important? Uh, I would say the fornix is more important than the corpus callosum especially if you harm both furnaces. Uh, the limbic system, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a two-sided uh, system. Uh, we have one limbic system on each side. You can, you can harm one of the limbic system. You can uh, take off one amygdala, you can remove one hippocampus, you can harm one fornix without having a lot of psychological problems, neuropsychological problems with this, but you cannot harm both, both furnaces. And that's why the interfornicial approach, uh, I would be a little bit afraid of doing it because uh, you cannot harm both. About uh, the, trans, the anterior transcalosal approach, it usually does not have uh, uh, major functional deficits. Um, yeah, we do this regularly, these small colosotomies, as I said, two and a half centimeter posterior to the genu, uh, we do like a two or three centimeter uh, colosotomy. And uh, on our experience, we have not seen uh, disconnection syndrome is, I mean, uh, major functional deficits. Thank you. Is there any other question from Benares?
Thank you. Okay, well, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank to you, be Dr. Weber.